First released in arcades in early 2000, Marvel vs. Capcom 2 New Age of Heroes doesn't really need an introduction. We all know about the game's giant character roster, big combos, and killer soundtrack, so I won't go deep into the obvious stuff. With the upcoming release of the Marvel vs. Capcom collection for modern consoles and PC, I was overjoyed to see the original games making a grand return, especially games with very few ports like X-Men Children of the Atom and X-Men vs. Street Fighter. But this got me thinking about Marvel 2, because while this game has had many ports over the years, I've realized that I've never tried all of them out, so that's what we're here to do. Let's explore every single port of this game to see both the positives and the negatives of each version, and also to shine some light onto the forgotten versions of the game, like the iOS port for example. As a disclaimer, I do lack access to some of the consoles this game was ported to, so I'm mostly going to be relying on emulation to record footage, although I do own a copy of the original Xbox and Xbox 360 versions of the game, so I can play those on actual hardware. I also won't be able to document every single change in every single port, so if I miss out on anything, let me know in the comments. With all of that out of the way, let's begin properly by examining the gold standard of Marvel vs. Capcom 2 ports. Released in 1999, Sega's final console, the Dreamcast, had no bad games and it was a massive financial success, we all know this, but what we also know is that this console received a wonderfully created port of Marvel vs. Capcom 2. Running at a resolution of 480i at 60 frames a second, the Dreamcast version is widely considered to be the most accurate port of the game, and a lot of people even consider it to be arcade perfect. For starters, all of the content in the arcade version is present here, so every character, stage, and frame of animation makes an appearance, for example. Since the arcade version ran on Sega's Naomi arcade board, which is very similar to the hardware inside of the Dreamcast, these two versions are nearly identical, although there is a big difference when you start playing these versions for the first time. In the arcade version, you would unlock characters by putting coins into the machine to level up the arcade cabinet, which is represented by this graphic down here. At level 1, you start out with only 28 characters, but in the Dreamcast version, you start out with only 24. Since you obviously can't put coins into your Dreamcast, you unlock the characters by heading into the Secret Factor menu, and you can use points you earn by playing the game to unlock not only new characters, but also new stages and colors, and this menu acts on a rotation with the cost for new items being semi-randomized. After unlocking all of the characters on both the arcade and the Dreamcast version, you may notice that the character select screen itself has been altered for the home console version. Some characters are in completely different spots, and this always throws me for a loop when I go between the different games. Going back to the secret factor for a moment, the way I described it only applies to the western versions of the game, but according to a quote from the Cutting Room Floor website, The method for unlocking characters and other content in this game was pretty straightforward. The more you play, the more points you earn which can be used to buy things in the secret factor. This wasn't the case for the Japanese version, where you had three different sets of points. D points, which were earned in arcade mode as in other regions, V points, which were earned by plugging your VMU into a Marvel vs. Capcom 2 arcade machine and playing the game, and N points, which were earned by playing online matches. The three-tier point system was streamlined into a single point system for the US version due to the online mode being removed from this version, and VMU support being removed from the US version of the arcade version. That's right, in Japan, you could physically plug your VMU into the arcade cabinet and play online matches too. While online play was cut from the Dreamcast port's western version, I still consider this to be part of the game, and it's obviously a huge difference between the two. To be perfectly honest with you, other than the things I've mentioned already, I don't notice any big changes in the Dreamcast port. The Dreamcast version and the arcade version are almost identical, and it just goes to show how good this home port is. It's still being played by top-level players to this very day, and for example, Romnito uploads multiple videos a day on his YouTube channel, and hell, people have figured out how to mod the game to have new music, stages, textures, etc. Overall, there's really nothing negative I have to say about this version of the game, and if you want to play it online, I highly recommend it via an emulator. I've had the pleasure of playing Marvel vs. Capcom 2 on a 4x3 monitor at my fighting game locals in the past, and even on the original hardware to this day, it feels fantastic. I do believe that the Dreamcast version has some little gameplay changes and some bug fixes, but it's still the competitive standard for a reason. It's still really good. You know what? Not so bad. We're off to a pretty good start here, so let's go into the next port and see if it's any good. Moving forward in time to 2002, Sony's PS2 console finally received a home port of Marvel vs. Capcom 2, and as this console was infinitely more popular than Sega's console, it made perfect sense to port this game to the system. This would have been a tricky process, however, as Marvel vs. Capcom 2 itself was created to run on Sega's hardware, so let's see how the game performs on something completely different. During my research, I came across this old game FAQs post that lists a bunch of things wrong with the PS2 port, so I wanted to test them out. For reference, I'm playing this on the PCSX2 emulator in the PS2's native resolution, and I also haven't enabled any graphical or audio enhancements. We're not starting off strong here, because the game looks sort of blurry, and it just looks a lot less clear than the Dreamcast version. I thought that I needed to put on my glasses when I was playing it, but I soon realized that this is just how the game looks. 
The colors also look a little bit different too, and I think that it's due to how washed out the whole thing is on the PS2. Also, before I even got past the main menu, I noticed that the game's audio quality isn't amazing. Storm, for example, has had all of her sound effects really compressed, and some of her sound effects have even changed, and it just doesn't sound right. I'm unsure why the PS2 port has both compressed versions of the original sounds and brand new sounds mixed together, but maybe it was due to hardware limitations. In terms of gameplay, it feels mostly the same as the original Dreamcast release on a surface level. Basic b and still work, and all the characters are here, which is good. Some of the glitches, like Gambit's way to leave the planet, have been removed, so it seems like Capcom went in and they did some fixing to the game's code. They didn't stop with bug fixes, however, as when you start looking into it, you realise that some pretty major aspects of the game balance have been changed too. Let's look at Cyclops, one of the most popular characters in the game. He's known for his godlike anti-air assist Gene Splice. This is a fantastic get-off-me tool with invincibility, but not in the PS2 port. This move can now be easily beaten out by a normal, a special, or even a super, so it's nowhere near as good as it was in the original. Speaking of nerfs, I've heard that alpha counters in general have all been nerfed to not be as safe as they are in the original, and this is also a pretty big change. Going back to assists, some characters with really good ones, like Tronbon for example with her ring projectiles, have remained the same. This move still hits like a truck, and perhaps it's due to Capcom either forgetting or just not bothering to nerf it. Some of the more broken stuff from the original Dreamcast version was removed, and some of it was kept in, so the balance changes in the PS2 port just feel really inconsistent as a result. Another major change is that due to the character sprites being in a different resolution, some of the hurt boxes have been altered, and this affects certain combos. The PS2 port supposedly has slowdown and frame rate issues, but I didn't come across any of this during my testing. I suspect that this is due to me playing on an emulator, but I'm still counting the slowdown as part of the PS2 port. Speaking of gameplay, and this is something that I really like, you can actually set macros for pressing both punches and kicks in the controller settings. The PS2 controller has more buttons than the Dreamcast controller, and even though most people play Marvel 2 on a fight stick, it's still really good that Capcom included this feature here. I was using a pad when recording footage, so having access to one button ground and air dashes was really helpful, so I have nothing negative to say about this feature. Another thing that I sort of like is that there's an art gallery of sorts where you can look at each character's unique artwork, but even this isn't presented in the highest quality. You can zoom in and look around, but there's not much point in doing this considering that every character only has one image associated with them. Overall, this version of the game is... it's not very good in my opinion. I mean, it's functional and it can be enjoyed if you really have no other option, but this game was never going to be played competitively due to the balance changes and the slowdown. Released in Europe and Japan in 2002 and North America in 2003, the Xbox port of Marvel vs. Capcom 2 had me worried for two reasons. Firstly, if it was anywhere near as mediocre as the PS2 port, then I'd tear all my hair out playing it, and secondly, this version specifically doesn't have a lot of information online detailing what makes it different to the Dreamcast version. So, I hooked up my original Xbox, I put in my totally legitimate copy of the game, and I fired it up. Even though I played the game on original hardware, I don't have a way of using my capture card with a system this old, so I couldn't record my own footage using a capture card. And secondly, emulating this game on Xbox is a real pain. If I use CXBX Reloaded, I have broken sprites that failed to render properly, and if I tried to use CMU, I just get this error message. Believe me when I say that I spent the better part of a Monday night trying to fix this, but I just couldn't. The footage you'll see for this section will be a mix of my own Gorilla recordings and footage that I found on YouTube, so just pretend that you're back in the early 2000s when people would point camcorders at the TV. Firstly, I noticed that the audio quality of the game sounded about the same as it does in the PS2 version, and some of the sound effects are also different. Storm Standing Light Punch sounds like how it does in the PS2 port, not the Dreamcast version, so it leads me to believe that these two versions are very similar. Marvel vs. Capcom 2 in general uses the ADX format for its audio, but I think the compression is what's hurting it here. Another thing that I quickly notice involves one of my favourite characters, Cable. In the Dreamcast and the arcade versions, his magic series has a tendency to drop if you don't time the super jump perfectly, and the enemy can quite often be too high up in the air to be hit by his jumping heavy kick, but not in the Xbox version. No matter what happens in this situation, the game will force Cable to be level with his opponent. This tells us that there are balance changes throughout this Xbox port, and as I unfortunately haven't unlocked every character, I can't test all 56 of them out. On the topic of gameplay though, the PS2 port's control options are here, which is good. Although instead of having L1 and R1, the original Xbox controller has the white and the black buttons. You can super jump, press Y for the heavy, and then hold down back and mash the white button to get the air dash and the air heavy punch out. 
This makes building meter with a storm on pad super easy, and it's also really funny to do. Another thing that I noticed was that the game feels slow. It's hard to put into words exactly, but every character just feels a bit heavier when compared to their Dreamcast and arcade incarnations. This port still runs at 60 frames a second, but I still feel like there's something a bit weird. At first I thought this was just my TV, but I tried playing some other games on the same TV on the same console and they felt fine, so I don't know. Another thing that might just be my TV is that part of the game is slightly cut off. The word Capcom on the main menu is too close to the edge of the screen, and some of the assist information is also cut off. No other game on my system does this, and I even found that IGN's review of the Xbox port mentioned the same thing, so maybe it's just a minor issue with the game itself. In terms of content, it's pretty much the exact same as the previous versions, meaning that it lacks online play. This was a big point of criticism back in the day, and it's one of the reasons why the aforementioned IGN review resulted in a 3.9 out of 10. Ouch! Another thing I'll point out is that the Xbox port has the worst loading times out of all the ports I've talked about so far. The gallery mode also makes a return, which is good, and all of the stages and the music are here too, so it's pretty feature-rich. I also tried to cause the game to slow down in trading mode by doing a bunch of visually intensive team supers, but this game ran at a solid 60 frames a second the whole time. I'm pretty sure that the Xbox version is just the PS2 version with some very slight differences here and there, but the base game remains unchanged from the PS2 port. If I had to pick one of these, I'd go with the Xbox version as I think it looks and sounds a little bit better, and not having sprites with the incorrect resolution is always a bonus. Now, let's move on to a time when Marvel vs. Capcom 2 entered the realm of HD games. Announced in April of 2009, Marvel vs. Capcom 2's HD re-release was slated for the Xbox 360 and the PS3, although I'm recording footage from the Xbox 360 version specifically. These two versions have some minor differences with their performance and the online play, but I'll be combining them both into this one section for time purposes. Before anything else, I'll say that this version has all the important stuff that you'd want. An updated menu system, widescreen support, achievements, character move lists, and online play. The latter is the biggest new addition, as it marks the first time that Marvel vs. Capcom 2 has been made playable online outside of Japan, and this port actually has rollback netcode, which is really cool. Another great thing is that having to unlock characters has been removed, so every character and color is ready to be selected right from the get-go. The game is also presented in a 16x9 resolution in HD, rather than the 4x3 resolution and standard definition of the original game. This new resolution makes the game look really crisp, and it's great seeing the original sprites animated in this way. And speaking of animations, all of the animation frames are present and accounted for here, so every move looks and functions the way that it should. Some of the stages are affected by this visual upgrade, however, as due to the boost in aspect ratio, you can see that some of these stages have cutoff points that couldn't be seen in the original release. Hell, you can even see out of bounds sometimes. However, this has no impact on the gameplay, which is pretty good. If you don't like the way that the sprites look, you can play around with the game's newly included visual filters, although I just use the default setting. This is all great, but this port also has some issues, so let's get into them. I stumbled across an old thread on the Shoryuken forums, rest in peace, during my research with a list of some of the gameplay changes found in this version. A big one is that Cyclops' infinite no longer works due to changes with the hitstun on some of his normals, and other characters are also affected by gameplay changes too. I'm not an expert at Marvel 2, far from it, but if this is truly the case then it goes without saying that characters who rely on air lights for certain infinites, like Cyclops obviously, have been affected pretty badly. Much like the PS2 port, some of the glitches have been removed, but some are still in the game for some reason. Ruby Heart's teleporting and sprite glitches from the arcade version are gone, but Guile's Team Super glitch is still in this version, so this version is a bit inconsistent with the bug fixes. The developers behind this port, Backbone Entertainment, stated in a 2009 press release that the HD versions were made with the Dreamcast version's codebase as a point of reference, so it's a shame that there are unique quirks specific to these versions of the game. If you're looking at the HD ports from a purely casual or intermediate level of play, then it's a great way to experience Marvel 2, but there's a reason why the top players prefer to use the Dreamcast version to this very day. A good amount of people from all skill levels also like to netplay the PS3 version using the RPCS3 emulator, so the HD port can be played for fun and even competitively, but it still pales in comparison to the original Dreamcast version. In my view, if you want to play this game properly on actual hardware and you don't have access to a Dreamcast, then try to get your hands on the HD version. No, this isn't a joke, and yes, I did buy it back in the day. Released in 2012 for iOS devices, Marvel vs. Capcom 2's mobile port was... interesting to say the least. Gone to the feel of tactile buttons, so you'll have to play the game using touch controls, obviously. There are four buttons, punch, kick, assist, and special. These are all easy to understand, but special moves are incorporated a bit weirdly into this version. Basically, your specials will be different depending on whether you tap or swipe the special button in a certain direction, and I remember this system working well enough. If you want another control scheme, the original button layout is included, but handling all this on a 2010's iPhone sounds like a nightmare. 
Another fear-inducing part of this version is that you also have to unlock all of the characters again. I remember playing arcade mode over and over and over as a kid to unlock all the characters, and while it was fun at times, I do remember the controls being very frustrating to use, so they're easily the worst part of this port. According to a review I found from TouchArcade.com, this port has noticeable frame rate issues, and when you combine this with the controls, it makes the simple act of just playing the game properly very challenging. I have absolutely no idea how you're supposed to do proper combos in this version of the game to be honest, as when I was a kid I just used a button mash. This version of the game also has local multiplayer via Bluetooth connectivity, but it does lack online play, much like the original release of Street Fighter 4 iOS back in 2009. I can't imagine two iPhones on early 2010s internet trying to play a match of Marvel 2 in sync without any technical hiccups, so perhaps it's for the best that this game lacks online play. Going back to Street Fighter 4 iOS for a moment, that game was specifically made for iOS and Android, whereas Marvel 2 is obviously a port of the Dreamcast version. So trying to get a Naomi game running on a smartphone must have been quite the challenge for Capcom's poor mobile games division back then. Even though this game has frame rate issues, it's still mind-boggling to think that there exists a version of this game that can run on your smartphone. Unfortunately, the iOS port of Marvel 2 was delisted from the App Store a long time ago for legal reasons, so there's no way to get it back. The game also can't run on 64-bit based devices, so if you have a modern phone like me, it's not going to work. I'm sure there's some way to get it back if you have an old phone that's hacked, but it sucks that this version wasn't brought back officially when Capcom regained the licensing rights to the series. For a game with this many licensed characters, I'm surprised that both Marvel and Capcom were willing to port this game to so many systems, especially to smartphones. Some ports are definitely better than others, and while I still think that the Dreamcast version is the best overall, the other versions of the game have their unique pros and cons, and some of them are so janked to the point where embracing their mediocrity with friends is amazing. If I had to rank these ports from best to worst, I'd say Dreamcast, PS3 360, Xbox, PS2, iOS. In regards to the aforementioned Marvel vs Capcom collection, Capcom has let members of the press try out the game and the pre-release reception has mostly been positive, so I have high hopes for the game. It's a long shot, but I really hope that this can usher in a new era of Marvel vs Capcom, with a brand new game in the series hopefully coming to light one day.